to go through the next few slides about embryogenesis, etc. Because it's important, because a lot of what's done in epigenetics also covers the in utero period. Okay, so and I don't think for this audience I need to go through this into much detail, starting with the, uh, the zygotes all the way through to the embryos, all the way through, uh, there we go, this is a mouse at embryonic day 11 and a half, etc. Okay, but what's going on for our DNA methylation? So we're starting off uh, at the moment, the fertilization, we've got our methylation, okay, the sperm and the egg, they've got their methylation. They fuse and almost immediately all of the paternal genome is demethylated okay this is literally at the stage of fertilization the one cell stage two cell stage maternal genome okay is uh, pretty much demethylated there's a few genes the imprinted genes that remain but as a general rule, yes, we've got a question from the audience. Sorry, so demethylation—that is when it goes past. Every uh, okay, demethylation is when it comes out. Methylated is methylated is condensed. So the question was about uh, the methylation and the demethylation as to whether the DNA was condensed or not, and I was just saying that in the demethylated state at the bottom here it's the very relaxed all accessible okay this is what's making the cell totipotent that means it can then develop into anything okay so that then uh, actually there's some very nice uh, images so what we see here is the maternal genome and the paternal genome just literally at the moment of fertilization and we see this is an antibody labeling the methylation on the DNA and we see there the paternal has lost its DNA methylation okay so this is how we've done these exper experiments like this yes so, is there any reason why the paternal methylation is demethylation honestly okay the question was is there a reason why the paternal is demethylated first and the answer to that is I don't know there must be a reason I don't know if anybody's gone out and done it, and I'd have to look into the literature to see if there was a reason that was known. Okay? So, but then afterwards, reprogramming happens again. Okay? So by the time we start getting to the blastocyte, methylation starts coming in. Okay? So the imprinted genes, some of them never stay, and some of them always remain unmethylated. But then, as we start developing into the different layers of cells, at this point, methylation starts coming back, okay? And all the way through to birth, it comes back, but then you're born, and then all the way through life, aging process happens, and we very, very slowly start losing our DNA methylation, okay? That's the DNA methylation of the life cycle. So you see why this early life period is so important. This is when everything is put in place. Okay, and uh, here we've just put in at the end, sort of the aging process. Okay, and as we're aging, things are descending. You get some CPIG islands where methylation actually increases with aging, but generally aging is going down. And then you reach the point, and here the example for this particular uh, paper I copied it from was cancer. And cancer is really large changes in methylation, switching on oncogenes, switching off uh, oncorepressors, etc. And they're big, big changes. But everything that we're going to be interested in for the next two and a half days is going to be small changes. It's the environment making small changes to the epigenome. Okay. Okay. And th this is just an example. Uh, it's a paper that we published a few years ago. But here is actually the promoter of the glucocorticoid receptor at the top, okay? And we've got places where we can methylate. And we've also got uh, places where proteins bind to induce transcription. And I just wanted to give you an idea here. When we mutate out these sites, 
so the proteins can no longer bind to drive transcription, we cut the expression down to about 40% of what it was to begin with. So expression is just the amount of gene that we've got produced, okay? But then when we put these methylations on, but we reduce it down to somewhere on average between 60 as the lowest, 80. Some positions don't actually do anything. So you can see that it's not as strong as a mutation, but you can see how we're dimming, etc. So this is a real concrete example from uh, the glucocorticoid receptor controlling the stress response. Okay, so as we're coming on to this, I also thought I ought to mention that methylation is sort of a regional thing. Okay, it's not one, one CPG is here and the next CPG, a few nucleotides downstream is down there. Okay, it's sort of a broad process. Now, this is again from the glucocorticoid receptor. What we've got on the x-axis here is the distance between two CPGs in a gene promoter. Okay, so when the distance is short, a few nucleotides apart, okay, the correlation in methylation between them is somewhere on average between about 50 and 80%. Okay, but then as we move along the axis, What's happening is as they're getting further apart, the correlation in the amount of methylation between them is diminishing, okay? So pretty much within about, I would say, 75 base pairs, okay, 75 base pairs in the length of a gene is relatively small, but the methylation is all doing the same thing, okay? So things are moving over regions. Just keep that idea in mind. Okay. And then here, another example, this is again the glucocorticoid receptor. If we take sort of the methylation over an area, and then we look at the uh, gene expression, we get a relative, it's not the world's nicest correlation, but two examples. This one at the bottom right is much better. So the more methylation we have, the lower the expression of the gene. I just thought they were two examples that nicely bring this to you. Because the glucocorticoid receptor, we're going to be talking about the HP axis, we're going to be talking about the stress response. The glucocorticoid receptor is what does the feedback for this. Okay? So, what we're going to do now, I've tried to give you sort of a, a theory overview. And what I want to do now is sort of turn this into practice. So what we're doing in the lab, what you will see in the literature as well. Because if somebody gives you a, a paper and says, this is an epigenome study, you need to have an idea of what they're talking about. Okay? So we're going to talk about bisulfite modification. This is an important technique, okay? And a few other things. And particularly tomorrow, we're going to be talking about study design and power calculations. Okay, but they're going to come in later in the course. So. This is something we produced a few years ago. It's a bit of a guide to help you choose. So do you actually want to do global or do you want to do locus specific? Remember the words locus, just a small region of the DNA. Okay, do you want to go genome wide or candidate gene? Okay, so you'll find this in the notes. And for those of you who are online, we can send you this in PDF. But we're going to start here, particularly on these bead arrays. And all of this relies on one thing. And this thing is called bisulfite modification. Okay? Because we need somehow to be able to see the difference between DNA that is methylated and DNA that isn't methylated. Because remember what I said, that your, your cytosine is there. It still binds to its G in the other strand. It behaves just like a normal nucleotide. Okay, if we try and sequence it, it just says it's a C. Okay, so we need to do something to be able to see the difference between a cytosine that's methylated and not methylated. So what we do, it's a chemical reaction. It's called bisulfite conversion. So what we're actually doing is we're chemically modifying a cytosine. Okay, and we're turning it in the end to a uracil. Now, to a uracil. 
to a cytosine to a uracil. Okay? Uracil, it's an RNA base. But then if you do using your molecular biology enzymes, it recognizes it as a T. Okay? But this reaction happens for a normal cytosine, but it doesn't happen for a methylated cytosine. Okay? Very simple. Now, if you do this reaction, all the cytosines that are unmethylated in your genome suddenly become Ts. Okay? Then you can sequence it. And when you had a methylation, it's still there as a C. So you can see, you've got a C, or that it's been turned into a T. Okay? When you have, so the question was what happens when you have methylation? Well, when you have methylation, the reaction doesn't work. So it stays as a methyl cytosine. Okay? And then afterwards, whatever we do in the lab, we see it as a cytosine. Okay? And here we just have an example. So if you look at the series of, of circles, here we've got a CG, CG, and another C. The spots on are our methylations. Okay? The first step we do is our bisulfite modification. Now, the Cs there, they remain the same. What happens to our C here, which is not methylated? It becomes a U. Then whatever biology we do in the lab afterwards, we see it as a T. So if we sequence it, we see the CG, we see the CG, so we know they were methylated. And then we have the C that's become a T, so we know it was unmethylated. Yes? It happens irrespective. All of the C's, if they are not methylated, become a T. So a CG that is not methylated becomes a TG. And a C just in the middle that's not followed by a G should automatically become a T. Okay? So this actually makes the, the sequencing a little bit harder because you know your genome you then actually need to align the sequence that you get to a bisulfite modified genome. Because you know the C's that weren't followed by G's should have become T's. And we're going to do a short practical exercise on this. If everybody has, uh, hang on, I just wanted to, just to show this. It's a simple, you do it now in a simple kit. A company called Kyogen sell the kit. And it's pipette a few microliters of this. Put your sample in. Incubate it. Pipette a few microliters of this buffer in. Everybody here in this lab in 20 minutes, we can teach you how to do it. Okay? It's really simple by sulfide modification. But intellectually, what it's actually doing is a little bit harder. So, what we do. First of all, this is the sequence we're interested in. Okay? You find your CGs. So here, in this particular example, we've got lots of CGs in it. Okay? Now, a C, if we're doing the bisulfite modification, if it's methylated or not, we replace it by the letter Y. Now, in biology, a Y means I don't know what it is, it could be a C or a T. Okay? It's what we call a wobble. So the, the Y is, this could be a C or a T. Then what we do is we replace what's left of the C's with T's. So now, in our sequence, we have no C's left. We've got the Y's, our wobbles, our it could be a C, it could be a T. Okay? And then, all of the C's that were left are now T's. Okay, this is sort of the intellectual part. 
Okay, and then we do some sequencing. So here we've got some primers we've designed. We read what we've got in the middle. And we get our sequence. Now, this is where it gets difficult. What I want you to do, has everybody got a piece of paper they can work on? Okay, what I want you to do, and even those of you online as well, at the top of the page, just make a random DNA sequence with A, C's, T's, and G's, okay? Now, on that, I want you to put in a couple of C, G's, and I want you to put in a C that's not followed by a G, okay? Now, sort of halfway down the page, we need to make the other strand of the DNA, okay? Now, does everybody know how to make the other strand of the DNA? Okay, well, in that case, uh, I don't have a board here or a thing to show you. Okay, but I, I will explain it. So if you write your sequence at the top, just take six or seven random ACTGs, okay? Now, to make the other strand of the DNA, you, you do it backwards. So your last nucleotide, so if you end your first sequence with a T, your other strand will start with an A, okay? And then you work backwards. So remember that if you have an A and a T, they pair. So a T becomes an A, and an A becomes a T. And then G, C go together. So if your next to last one was a G, your second one is a C, okay? Well, actually, what I'll do is I'll put my mask on and I'll come around the room and I'll make sure you're okay. Because what I want you to do is the, the aim of it is to see that the two strands become different at the end and we, we gain extra information. Okay. 
So the first step to do is that you, if you have a C G, you replace it by a Y G. But do this to both strands. Okay, so we've turned our CGs into YGs. Now, if you've got any Cs left in your sequence, sign them into Ts. Yes, regardless of the output, if you've got any Cs left, turn them into Ts. That's the bisulfide modification. Okay? Okay. So now you've got your forward and reverse strand of DNA, and we've done the bisulfide modification too. Now, your second strand that you made by reversing it, you need to reverse it back to what you had to be doing. Okay? But on your new sequence with your T's and Y's. This is your reverse strand. Yeah. So what you need to do is re-reverse it to try and get the original sequence. So you're going to go A, C, T, A. And then here. It doesn't matter if you put it there or there. If you put it there, you'll see the yeah. difference. And is that part of the body sometimes? The part yes, the part of the body sometimes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is great. Oh. Okay, basically. Then the 
analysis of the need to bring the lungs, yes, back to have an empty belly. So now you see at the end, you've lost the link. And your thought in your reverse trans of your DNA are completely different. Okay? This makes interpretation of sequencing horrible. Okay? But it also means that if you make PCR primers, you want to amplify it. Polymerase well, chain reaction. Sorry, I thought of COVID. Everybody knew what PCR was. <laughs> BPCR? PCR is copying. Yeah. It's copying and pasting DNA. Okay? But normally, PCR, it doesn't matter if it's the forward strand or the reverse strand. Now, to act by self modification, our forward and reverse strands are different. Okay? Now, normally, everything is done. Sense P to Q. Draw farm to long gun on the chromosome. That's the way epigeneticists tend to work. Okay? But on the capturing member, on the chromosome, genes go in both directions. Now, we tend to work on five sort type modification in one direction only. Okay? And we might lose information on the other strand. Okay? But it's something I wanted you to understand. This whole bunch sulfide modification and all the experiments we do afterwards, we lose information. We lose half of the DNA. Okay? It's important to just keep that in mind. And this is why PCR is negative PCR is false negative PCR. Right, it's hot. Awesome. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> that was a bit of a teaser to try and understand what's going on. But if I come back and I say the fundamental message, the fundamental message of this is we can do a chemical modification to the DNA. Now in the lab, it's an easy kit. Okay? You do it in about 20 minutes in the lab. Okay? But it does something weird and wacky to the sequence. But it allows us to actually read whether, when we sequence it, it was a C or a T that was there. And whether it was methylated or not. Okay? So sorry for those of you who are online who didn't um, get to do the practical exercise. But anyway, we will move on. Can you just click so I can... Okay, so the thing about this is we can do DNA methylation at a single base pair resolution, okay? So you can see exactly the nucleotide there, that CG, it is methylated, okay? But we have to be aware, you know, we're going to, we're doing chemical reaction on the DNA. It has some few negative points. You've got these in the slides. The DNA is degraded by the temperature and the pH. We might get an incomplete uh, conversion. Modern kits are really quite good. You're at 99.9% .9 conversion of the DNA. Okay. And sometimes it can be particularly difficult to map this to the genome. So if you're doing whole genome sequencing, okay, if you're doing whole genome sequencing, you might end up throwing away 80% of your data just because you can't find out where your sequence can be aligned back to the genome. Okay. So, doing this has its problems. Okay, whoops. But, oh, that's the right slide. What we have, and you will see in the literature, thousands of papers that use something called the Illumina Infinium Arrays. Okay, these have 850,000 little pieces of DNA on them, which bind to your bisulfite-modified DNA, okay? Now, what they do is you've got your CG, okay? You do the bisulfite conversion, okay? And afterwards, you've got a C or a T. 
then what happens in the system is it binds with this bead, okay? And then afterwards, you either, you try an adding, labeled in red, an A and a T, okay? Forward and reverse, okay? An A and a T. Now, if these bind, you know that it was methylated, sorry, unmethylated originally. If the greens, the C's and the G's bind, okay, then you know it was methylated. So what you're doing is you're taking your piece of DNA, you're using this bead with this bit of DNA that matches, that stops, and you're just filling in this one nucleotide afterwards. Okay, so it stops just before your CG and you try and fill in the right one. Okay, then you put it on this machine, you get a, a scanner and you get some colors. So the reds and the greens are your binding of your reds and greens. Okay, so you're either binding to be methylated or unmethylated. You're actually reading out from your DNA. What did I bind? Did I bind to the methylated sequence or did I bind to the unmethylated sequence? And it's quantitative, okay? So from that, you know exactly what you've got. Okay, so there you go. If you end up with two reds, it's methylated. Two greens, it's unmethylated, okay? So all you're doing is you're capturing with these beads and a bit of DNA, the DNA that's interesting to you. Remember, DNA always binds to its reverse complement. So if you've got a piece of DNA, in these, this particular technology, it's about 12 nucleotides long, okay? So your CG you're interested in, it's got like 12 nucleotides before it, but then it's missing the C. So it binds, and you try filling it in. And the filling in is this, okay? So you end up with two numbers. So for each CG, what you've got are these probes that are either unmethylated or methylated. Okay, and you quantify how much red can I buy? How much green can I buy? Okay, very simple. You end up with what's called an M value at the end. And it goes from zero to 100. It's as simple as that. Okay, now a few things. This is the reason you see this in the literature so much. They're easy to put, perform, it's easy to interpret the data. Okay, Sirian started her PhD with me. And literally within, what, six months, she was producing epigenome-wide association studies on this data, calculating it, okay? Once you understand how to do it, it's easy, okay? There are a few other things, a few, a few minor things, but this is limited to technology, and we know how to exclude them. The DNA has repetitive elements. So the, the, uh, the epics arrays, they don't have repetitive elements on them because you can't distinguish one from the other. So they're missing. You are missing certain parts of the genome. Okay? And it's not truly genome-wide, but they have, on average, within genes, one of these probes every approximately 100 base pairs. Remember the figure I showed you about the correlation in methylation levels? Get to about 75% and you cut 75 nucleotides apart. And your correlation is about 50 to 60 percent. Less than that, you start getting up towards 80 percent correlation. Further away, they start being becoming independent. Okay, so it's not truly genome wide, but they're close enough that you're getting a good idea of what's going on. This is why I showed you that figure with the correlation. So now you understand we don't need to probe absolutely everything, but in the epics, in the, the opinion epics array, 850,000 throughout the genome you get a reasonably good picture of what's going on. Okay, and here, uh, Illumina make this piece of software. You can, you can download it for free, okay? Basically, the machine costs money, the arrays cost money, and the kits to do the experiment cost money that you buy from the company. So they give you the software for free because you have to spend the money on their equipment, on their kits to get the data. Okay, it's really simple. It's click, 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 click. Now, we don't tend to use this, but we've made for you a series of video tutorials of how to do it yourself. 
okay? Because you can go to websites like the NCBI in the US, to the GEO database, and there are lots of studies that you can download. You can download the data. You can download the metadata, and you can start looking into it yourself, okay? So we will find a way of distributing to you the videos that Cyril made. We do this ourselves in the lab, and we will happily help any of you if you find the data set that exists and you can have the data. Watch the videos, phone us up and we can help you do it. But it's easy. You understand what's going on now. You understand these values that you're getting. Afterwards, it's statistics. It's data analysis. Okay? So I wanted to put in one word here because in the first journal club, I've got an article, it's a bit of an older one that we wrote, where we start looking at the levels of methylation and we start asking the question, is it biologically meaningful? Okay. And the question also comes out, are there other epigenetic modifications? Now, over the last few years, DNA sequencing has improved enormously. And there's a US company called PacBio. And they have a technology that allows you to read, just going along a piece of DNA, what the epigenetic modifications are there. And with technology like this, we're now starting to find, I've been talking about a methyl group added to a C, a cytosine, okay? And you can now actually pick up methyl groups added, for example, to an adenine. So there are other epigenetic modifications. And we had a publication last year on methyladenine. So what I would say is the five methylcytosine we've talked about so far is what everybody knows. It's what's easy to do, okay? But epigenetics in the future will be finding other technologies. So this single molecule real-time sequencing, they call it from PacBio, it just goes through and you see from the real-time reading here, it sees it's added an A, but there's a big pause. Whereas normally an A, there's a little pause. And they've discovered that, that actually means that the adenine that was there originally was methylated. Okay, so just have the idea in your mind that there are other things and we have ways now we can see them. Big problem with this is to do a human genome on PacBio, reading it like that will cost you 30,000 euros. And if you want to do a statistically significant study where you have to sequence 300 people, I, I, don't want, I don't want to pay the bill. Okay? But the information you get out at the end is wonderful. Okay? So, in the slide, you've got the decision tree. Okay? And at the end, I'm just going to quickly touch on this allele specific. Because often, what's interesting to you is a gene of interest. Okay? We've done lots of studies on stress on the glucocorticoid receptor, okay? I mean, we're not interested in all the other genes in the genome. So we want to go specifically to the glucocorticoid receptor. And now we use a technique called pyrosequencing. Now it's got a long list of ingredients, okay? But I'm going to simplify it for you. What pyrosequencing does is it takes a piece of DNA, obviously disulfide modified, and what it does the DNA polymerase is going along, it adds on a nucleotide, and at the end, it releases an ATP. ATP is the molecule of energy for, for all cells. And we use that with luciferase. It's another enzyme which turns oxyluciferin into luciferin. Anybody know what luciferin and oxyluciferin are? Fireflies. Fireflies with their, their, their glowing bottoms? That's what it is. The light is exactly the same light as a firefly. Okay? Luciferase. Making luciferin and light. But this is quantitative. Okay? And you end up with a graph. Now, if I've done my bisulfite modification to begin with, this isn't... Uh, hang on, there isn't a GC there. But if I had a CG, my CG I would be replaced by a Y. And what it will actually tell me is... For my Y here, 
you have in this sample 10% C, 90% T. So in your sample, 10% of your, of your copies of your genome were methylated at that point. Okay? Now, this particular technique, it's about the most sensitive. And if you really want to know the methylation level in your gene, this is the technique to use. Okay? But once again, by sulfite modification, as we did the exercise on paper, changes the sequence, you have to be very careful. But at the end, you can quantify it. Okay? So now I'm going to move on to a little bit. Next 20 minutes, just a quick summary on the epigenetics of stress. And here, nice brain, everybody knows what the brain is. Who knows about the HPA axis and things like that? So if I start talking about uh, hypothalamus, hippocampus, pituitary gland, everybody's okay with it. Ah, we're on safe territory there. This is good. Okay, so particularly in early life stress, particularly here in the hypothalamus, HPA axis coming down, glucocorticoid receptor at the bottom, what we end up with often is increased OMC ACTH, increased adrenal gland activity, decreased glucocorticoid receptors, and decreased feedback. Okay? Really, that's interesting side of that figure. And I usually put it here as well. So, HPA axis, CRF from the hypothalamus, anterior pituitary, ACTH through the blood, to the adrenal cortex, making cortisol. Cortisol feeds back, first of all, to the adrenal cortex to itself. Okay? To the glucocorticoid receptor. To the pituitary, again to the glucocorticoid receptor there. Okay? Negative feedback. And to the hypothalamus. Okay? HP axis, it's the response to stress, lots of physiological processes, the immune system, etc., depend on it. Glucocorticoids release, released by the adrenal glands. Okay? And what's happening with our early life stress? Well, it's decreasing birth weight, decreasing gestational time, altering development and behavior afterwards, increasing anxiety, depression, and PTSD, mood disorders, cardiovascular disease, obesity, uh, enzymes like 11-beta-HSD. Anyone know what 11-beta-HSD is? It's the cortisol inactivating enzyme. Okay? A bunch of other things moving. But well, what's changing is this negative feedback here. So a lot of work's been going on as to how this negative feedback on stress is dealt with, okay? And this is the work that we did <clears throat> some time ago. But the glucocorticoid receptor, now this is the description of the gene. Remember I told you about promoters and then the, the coding regions, etc. cetera. Here, this, the, the protein is made from exons two to nine. Okay, here the exons 1A to 1H. This is the promoter region. This is the region that controls the expression. And actually what we found is here, it's a CPG island. And here we've got the promoter region. And in it, there's lots of regions which are in, in, independently used. And what we actually have, each one of these, as I said, in the gene structure, in the uh, earlier about the, what a gene was, this actually, each one of these, when we go through the splicing, so they're reducing from the 100 megabases down to three, okay? Each one of these black, blue, dark blue boxes actually gets joined to two, okay? And there's a promoter region in front of each one of these, okay? And here's just an example. SK and SH are, are neurons, okay? 293FTs are kidney cells. And what we see is these different regions of the promoters are used differently, for example, here between a kidney and a neuron. Okay? And this is what's called a CPG island. So here we've got lots of possibilities for the DNA methylation. So if you start reading the literature uh, about the glucocorticoid receptor, you will see lots of literature about this one, the promoter 1F. Okay? There's Probably now 150 papers on the epigenetic regulation of this promoter 1F. Okay? It's all about changes the DNA methylation there. And this is what you're starting to see. 
okay? So this is the one seven in the rat, and this is, uh, actually this one's one H in, 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 the, in the human. But we're starting to see changes here. But these methylation differences are very small, okay? But what we're actually seeing is here, this particular example, it's restraint stress. So it's an acute stressor that we're giving. And what actually, between the different bars, it's the different lengths of the, of the, of the, of the stressor. But actually increasing the methylation of the promoter with a stressor. Okay? So this is taken a certain number of hours, I can't remember now, uh, after the stressor. Okay, so we've stressed, and then we've taken away the stressor. And then it was a stressor that was zero and 15 minutes and an hour of stress. Okay, so we're seeing, and then we looked, I think we measured it four hours later. Okay, so we can see that we're actually able, just with a stressor, to increase the methylation of the gene. This is in an adult, okay? It's much stronger in kids, except we can't do the experiment. We can do it in mice and rats. We, we, we can't go out and uh, give kids stress tests, okay? So this is a real example. Now, this was done with the pyro sequencing, the one where it makes the light at the end, the luciferase and the firefly, okay? But you can see the resolution we're getting. These are the different CPGs in the promoter region, and we're starting to see how we can modify it, okay? And this is part of a, a, a paper that we're going to be using in the journal club afterwards or this afternoon okay and there's lots of different environments that do exactly this lots of different uh phenotypes that we see afterwards and we see here's the examples of the changes in methylation we see and all of this fits very nicely with what we see here and these small changes in methylation okay always raises the question what does it mean what does it really mean changing here, for example, methylation from 6% of the cells being methylated to 8%? But it's there, it's significant, and it gets you a paper. But what does it mean? Big question. And I think we're going to be asking that question several times over the next few days. Okay? So, this, seeing this and seeing these small changes asked, led us to asking a simple question. What's actually going on? We're going to look at the glucocorticoid receptor, the stress axis in more detail. What's actually going on in the healthy population? Okay, this is a cohort that we took. We call it a healthy and in inverted commas uh, population because it's young undergraduate psychology students in the University of Trier. Not sure they're the most healthy and uh, representative uh, population. Okay. But we had a couple of hundred, and this is the, the usual um, uh, consort. This is what we did, the dropouts, etc. But at the end, we had reasonable numbers, 138 people there and 72 in that arm of the study. Okay. And the first thing we did, we're interested in what's controlling the glucocorticoid receptor. So this is the absolute standard we sequenced it. Okay. This is the normal sequencing and looking at the mutations. There's a bunch of mutations in there. Here's the standard linkage disequilibrium. You don't need to understand what linkage disequilibrium is, but all this is saying is what do we see at the same time? Okay? So what we're seeing here is a bunch of different sequence variants happening at the same time or not. Okay? Uh, we don't really need to look at that. But then, we also did a stress test on this. We did it together with the University of Trier, so we had no choice. We did the Trier social stress test. Does everybody know what the Trier social stress test is? Okay, there's a few no's. The Trier social stress test is basically what I'm doing now in front of you, okay? Trier social stress test is putting somebody in front of a blank audience and getting them to do a free speech, and a mental arithmetic task. There's a small preparation period, and then there's a period in front of the jury, okay? The mental arithmetic is really something stupid. They'll turn around to you and say, please count backwards from 2,376 in subtractions of 17. And then the jury, white face, blank face, 
white coat, serious. At some point, they'll turn around and say, wrong, start again. Wrong, start again. Okay, and there's a, there's a free speech element to it as well that you have to do. Okay, and it can be really, really stupid. Marie Antoinette and buying a baguette. What the hell do you know about that subject? But it's designed to put you in front of social evaluation. It gets the HP axis going. It gets the blood pressure going. It gets the heart rate going. It's basically a social evaluation in front of an audience, like me in front of you. You're a good audience, you're, you're responding to me. I can read on your faces what you think. When you've got blank faces, that's stressful. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So here we've done the sequencing and this is our haplotypes and we can see, not, not much difference in the stress, but big differences, for example, baseline. Okay, here, uh, heart rate based on haplotype, cortisol as well. So we have a big effect for one particular haplotype. So the actual sequence of the glucocorticoid receptor is doing things. Okay, it's really changing the stress response, particularly here, the baseline. And actually here, the delta is increased as well because the baseline was lower. We went away, we did the methylation. We don't know why, but in particularly in promoter 1H, the methylation in the females was slightly higher than in the males. It's not being reproduced. Somebody needs to reproduce that for us at some point. And again, here, actually, it's the same graph that I showed you earlier. The distance between the CPGs and the correlation between them, and then the correlation between two different promoters. So if you go back to here, we actually looked in this study at promoter 1F and promoter 1H, okay? So just so you see, so here, this was 1F, this was 1H. This is the distance between them, and this is then the correlation between the two promoters, okay? So we're seeing again this regional effect, okay? But unfortunately, we can't see the title, but what we've done here is we've done a simple median split. The statisticians would hate me for doing this, but we've just taken the methylation levels and we've taken a median split. It's high methylation and low methylation. And look what's happening. Okay, the control group, the high methylation, they're at the lower line, and they get a, a triosocial stress test. So you get, them, you get them through the preparation, you bring them into the room and you tell them their control group, have a cup of tea, just chat with us for five minutes. That's the control group, okay? And the, the, here, the stress test group, you can see blood pressure has gone right up, okay? But those who have high methylation, look at the baselines, okay? The delta is the same. The delta is the same. So the change from baseline to stress, okay? That's blood pressure. And then again, blood pressure, against methylation, okay? So we're actually starting to link the response to the stressor to the amount of methylation we actually have. So the key message from this study is that you've got your gene sequence. Your gene sequence has an effect, but you could have a much nicer effect from your DNA methylation. Okay, so here the DNA methylation is genuinely controlling, in this case we looked at it, the systolic blood pressure response to a stressor. Okay, and then here we actually did, 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 did the statistics for the interaction between the methylation and the genotype. Okay, and then we see particularly for the minor allele, uh, in, the, in the high methylation, we have a very strong interaction. So we actually have an interaction, accumulation, an, an accumulation between the methylation and the underlying sequence, actually in the measured physiological response. So this is the basics, okay? So once you understand this, if we give you a paper which says, uh, in this cohort where they've had this, Okay, now you understand what's going on. Okay, so you can interpret what they've done. Okay, so it's important that you understand this. So if you've got any questions,
or you can just come and ask me quietly at lunchtime. Okay? So, then we came on and asked the question, what happens when the HP axis is the start? Okay? Because this was in healthy, healthy. Three are mainly male undergraduate psychology students. So, where we've been working on for the last few years is early life adversity, which is why everybody's here and why we're all interested. We have our cohort in Luxembourg. It's called the EpiPath cohort. Okay, we have 40 uh, participants who were adopted. Now, these were adoptions into Luxembourg at a young age. Okay, the median age of adoption was only four months. Okay, but they were adopted from institutions. I've got about three slides left and then we're finished. Okay, so should we just we'll speed through the last three slides and then we go for lunch. Okay, and then we've got the controls. So adoptees, they were adopted into Luxembourg. Period adversity in an institution, adoption. Okay, we had them in the lab at age 24. Controls, these were either the non-adopted biological children of the adoptive parents. Okay, think about it. Infertile couple adopts, suddenly, two years later, ah, miracle, madame is pregnant. Okay, they were the gold standard. If we couldn't have them, we got immediate social circle controls. Okay. And then, this is the cohort, just so you can see. Controls and ELA, we, we balance them for sex. But this is age 24, and they only had on average four months in an institution. The controls, we have 4% with a chronic disease at age 24. Look at the adoptees, 40%. Okay? So if you don't believe me that bad conditions in the first four months of life completely screw you up. That's the proof. Okay? We unfortunately just missed statistical significance of the allergies. They take medication, but they have increased health risk behaviors. Okay? They smoke more. They do more drugs. They're more likely to be in prison. It's sad, but it's true. Okay? Uh, we did the, the skid one and skid two for those of you who are, who are into psychopathologies. And when you look at it, 33% of our adoptees had mood disorders and anxiety disorders. It was mainly type two, mainly depression. Okay. And here we did our favorite stress test. Okay. The heart rate didn't change with the stress test. But the cortisol response did. Okay? So we've been able to de deal with that. And when we went, then we went away, and this was a paper we published, end of 2020, early 21, and we were most disappointed. Guess what? Nothing was significant in the DNA methylation. Absolutely not a sausage. And worst of all, I haven't put the slides on because I'm so depressed about it. <laughs> the glucocorticoid receptor in the immune cells was 100% fully functional. Not a little bit different. So we're now scratching our head to actually work out what's going on. Because there's so much literature that says DNA methylation should change. But it doesn't. And the receptor functions. And um, th this is just the example. Oh, I did actually put the data in. Okay, simple. Immune cells, if you give them something they don't like, in this case, it was something called PWM, pokeweed mitogen. It's a horrid chemical that it causes them to proliferate. It causes them to produce cytokines. Okay, cytokines are these immune uh, signaling molecules. But if you give them dexamethasone, glucocorticoid, they calm down. They're zen. Okay? So, we stimulate them with this molecule they don't like. We give them dexamethasone at different concentrations. And if you look at it, the, the open ones are the adoptees, the closed ones are the controls. There's not a sausage of difference. 
We then calculated the IC50, so the, the, the half inhibitory concentration, to see, look at the actual receptor affinity and actual action. Not a sausage of difference between the two. Okay? So this is actually causing us to now go back and actually start questioning, is the whole hypothesis right? The stress axis, the glucocortico receptor, correct in at least our early life adversity context. But there's lots of other data from lots of other genes that says DNA methylation is involved. But here we went gene specific, and obviously, guess what? We took the wrong gene. These things happen, this is research. Okay, and oh, I'm going to skip over that. You've got this anyway. That was actually a mechanistic explanation of what's going on. But as uh, Sandra said, we're now eating into lunchtime. I've overrun by seven minutes. And I think actually that's a record for me of the least I've ever overrun. So all I can say is it's lunchtime now. If there's things you've not understood, please come and ask me over lunch. Okay, and for those of you who are online, send me an email, drop me a, a whatever, send a, send a message, send messages in the chat that we'll, we'll see later. Please, we'll try our best to answer them. <laughs>